Okay, so I always feel like I have to remind myself what day it is, where we're at in the semester, is there anything important to talk about? Nope, not important. The only thing important is PDEs. So we're talking on Tuesday about how to solve boundary value problems in the form of ordinary differential equations. Uh, so one dimensional problems. And we talked about the numerical solution procedure and how that would be applied so we're, we're now going to do the same thing, but for PDEs. And so now we're talking about two dimensional and or three dimensional problems. So same basic approaches, but now in a PDE context. So we're gonna focus on the Poisson equation. It's a famous equation, it's got a smart French guy's name associated with it. And it governs a lot of interesting phenomenon that we care about as engineers. It's basically, a slight generalization of the more familiar Laplace equation, which I've repeated here. So Laplace equation, partial squared u, partial x squared plus partial squared u, partial y squared is equal to zero. That's in 2D Cartesian coordinates. The Poisson equation is just the non-homogeneous form of that. So it just means there's a right-hand side function, f of x, y, forcing the behavior of the system. So, Again, basically the big change now is you're gonna see partials instead of Ds and we'll have multiple independent variables rather than just one. So X and Y instead of just X. So we can think of either one of those. We're gonna think in terms of the general Poisson equation just because it's a little bit more general. Obviously, if F, the special case of F is equal to zero corresponds to then Laplace's equation. And I'm gonna walk us through the uh, the, the kind of the structure of the problem, talk about the boundary conditions, and then I'll walk us through the numerical solution procedure as it applies to this two-dimensional setting. So now, rather than just having the boundaries be two endpoints, now the boundary is some curve in the xy domain. So now we're determining u of x, y inside that curve C. So now the boundary conditions must apply everywhere. So there, there is a boundary condition that applies at every point on this boundary. So in the 1D problem, we just had x, so the two ends were the boundaries. So now every point on this boundary has a boundary condition. The same types of boundary conditions, we could have Dirichlet, Neumann, or Robin. In the context of a heat transfer example, uh, you could think in terms of a Dirichlet condition, meaning it would be isothermal. So that means constant temperature on the boundary. A Neumann boundary condition in a heat transfer context would be like specifying a heat flux. So that would be like saying at the base of our extended fin, there's a prescribed amount of heat that's being conducted into the fin. And as we saw last time, a Robin boundary condition would correspond to a convection condition in the context of heat transfer. So again, three types of boundary conditions, same as before. And now you can think of kind of the physical context in which those would arise, which is the same as in the 1D case as well. The point being, you need a boundary condition at every point on the boundary. It doesn't have to be the same. You know, you could have Dirichlet at some points, you could have Neumann at other points, you could have Robin at other points, but every point needs a boundary condition in order to be mathematically closed. All right, so let's think in terms of the numerical solution procedure. So step one was to get the governing equation. So we've already done that. We have the Poisson or Poisson equation governs uh, heat, con heat conduction, electromagnetics, and a bunch of other things, elasticity and all kinds of other things. So let's focus then on step two. So this, sorry, this is step two. Of the numerical solution procedure, which is to discretize the domain 
as well as discretize the equation. So we went through this for the 1D case. We'll go through the same process. You'll see very close uh, relationship or analogy between the two. Obviously, it's just going to look a little more complicated now because it's two-dimensional. So in terms of the domain, it's going to look like this. So we have a two-dimensional domain. I'm going to, for now, keep things simple and just say, well, let's take a rectangular domain where x goes from 0 to a and y goes from 0 to b. And then we're going to divide up the x and the y axes into little itty bitty sub intervals. So you can see down here in the x domain, which goes again from zero to a, we're gonna divide that up into i equal sub intervals of length delta x. So that's exactly like the 1D case. So it's gonna look like this. At the left boundary that corresponds to i is equal to one. And then the next point will be i is equal to two, three, and then a generic point somewhere here will be i. The generic point to the left is i minus one, and the generic point to the right is i plus one. Again, just like the 1D case. Then the second to last point, i, capital I, and the last point, the right boundary is capital I plus one. Okay, super. Then we do the same thing in the y direction. So we're gonna take the y domain, which goes from zero to b, subdivided into capital J equals subintervals of length delta x. So same thing in y. So J is equal to one is the lower boundary. Then the first point is two, generic point is J. The one right before it is J minus one. The one right above it is, is J plus one. And then the second to last point is capital J. And then the last point at the top, top boundary is capital J plus one. So again, uh, same type of discretization. It's now both an X and Y instead of just an X. So it looks more complicated, but it's exactly the same approach. Then this is what we call our grid or our mesh. We'll use those terms interchangeably. So where all of these grid lines intersect, each of those intersection points is a grid point or a mesh point. And at each one of those points, we're looking for the solution. So we're going to end up with a system of capital I plus one times capital J plus one points. So that's all these intersecting points throughout the domain. And so we need just as many equations in order to solve for the values of U at each of those points in our 2D grid. All right, does that make sense? So again, just a natural two-dimensional extension to what we did last time in one dimension. All right, if you zoom in on this, so if you take this portion right here and you zoom in on it, uh, so a generic ij point, then you can think in terms of what we call the finite difference stencil. So a stencil is like a, like a prescription or a template that you put over and you move around. So if you want to make something look nice on your wall, you make a stencil of it, and then you trace it, you move it, you trace it again, paint it, and so forth. So we're going to use second order accurate central difference approximations, just like we did in the 1D case. So that's our standard. You, well, unless you have some good reason to do first order or higher order, we'll always do second order. And so in our case, we have two derivatives and they're both second order. We have a second order derivative in X and a second order derivative in Y. So we need second order accurate central difference approximations for both of those. We already know what they are. They're the same as they were in, in one dimension. And so we're gonna have a five point finite difference stencil. It looks like this. So again, this is zooming in on a generic point in the domain. So this is the IJ point. And then you have a point to the right, 
I plus one J, point to the left, I minus one J, point above, I J plus one, and a point below, I J minus one. These are each delta X apart on the horizontal and delta Y apart on the vertical. So once again, that is simply taking this portion of the domain and kind of just zooming in and blowing it up and looking at the five point stencil. The reason why we think about these stencils and you'll see me draw them a lot is it shows all of the points that affect the solution at a given location. So our generic IJ point and that stencil, that's what it's called a stencil, is gonna move around the grid. So it's gonna be true for all I and all J. So as it moves around the grid and then what we're saying is this is showing that if I want to get the solution at IJ that involves values at the north, south, east and west points. Because of the second order accurate finite difference approximation, central difference approximations that we're going to use, which involve the three points in the x direction, three points in the y direction, one point is in common, so five points, five point stencil. So continuing with step two of the numerical solution procedure, we have discretized the domain. Now we're ready to discretize the equation itself. So we have the partial, partial squared u partial x squared, partial squared u partial y squared. So second order accurate central difference approximations for those ui plus one j minus two uij plus ui minus one j over delta x squared. That's in the x direction. And you'll notice other than the J, if you get rid of the J, this is exactly what we had for the 1D case. So all we're doing is we're adding that J. So that's these three points, I minus one J, I J and I plus one J. That is still second order accurate in Delta X. Same thing for Y. So now it's the I that's the same because it's these three points along a vertical line through the grid. And now it's the J that's changing, J plus one, J and J minus one. So again, these three points are being handled by the, or involved, I should say, in the second derivative with respect to Y, which is also second order accurate. So second order accurate central difference approximations, just like in the 1D case, just written now for the two-dimensional scenario. We substitute those in. We add the second derivative with respect to X plus the second derivative with respect to Y is equal to F. And as we did with the 1D case, we're gonna multiply through by Delta X squared. And the reason for that was, and still is, so that the coefficients in our difference equation are order one. As it stands now, Delta X and Delta Y are small so you square small numbers and they get even smaller and then one over small numbers are big numbers. So the coefficients on my U's are very, very large. So by multiplying through by delta X squared on both sides, we can make it so the coefficients of each of our terms are order one. They're, they're not going to be huge, not going to be tiny, so it won't be a mess for the computer. Now on the right hand side, we have a small number delta x squared times the fij, so that will be small, but that's okay. It's uh, mathematically a little bit better to work with for the computer. So now 920, this is our finite difference equation. And remember, just it's longer, it looks more complicated, it actually has five unknowns now, one, two, three, four or five instead of three as it did in the 1D case. But nevertheless, it's the same pattern. It's the same basic approach. All of the unknown stuff is on the left and all the known stuff is on the right, just like it was for 1D. It's just that now we have more stuff that's unknown. And the five values, UI plus one J, UIJ, UI minus one J, UIJ plus one and UIJ minus one correspond to the five points in our five point stencil. Okay, so that, that all makes sense. It all fits together nicely. Okay, so now we have to think about in the 1D case, at this stage, we had a tridiagonal system of algebraic equations, 
right? So that was great. We we're very happy. We have our Thomas algorithm that we talked about early in the semester, direct method, very efficient, very fast, in other words, and also accurate in calculating tridiagonal systems. Now we actually have a, a system with five unknowns, so it's no longer tridiagonal. And so we need to think about how we're going to go about solving this. The what you'll find is that the attraction of using the Thomas algorithm is so great. It is so efficient and so easy to use that actually behooves us to convert our problem into, if we can, a bunch of tridiagonal problems or in some other way, simplify it so we can get uh, the solution. So I'll show you one way to do it. There are other ways to do it as well, but I'll show you one very straightforward way to handle this. It's actually something we've already seen earlier in the semester. Okay, so this is just kind of a reminder from chapter two. We have two different approaches. So this is now, this is step three in the numerical solution procedure. So in step three, we're solving our big system of equations. And again, just as kind of a reminder from chapter two, there's two classes of approaches. There are direct methods and iterative or relaxation methods. So we discussed this before, but just to kind of remind us of these two classes of methods. In a direct method, you have some set procedure. So there's a very prescribed process by which you get the solution. You go through the steps, and you get, if you do the every step exactly, you'll get the exact solution. So that's things like Gauss elimination, LU decomposition, those are direct methods. So you know what to do, you know how many steps are involved in doing it, and once you're done, you get the, the solution. There are no iterative convergence errors because there is no iteration. It's a direct method, so you're getting the solution of the governing, well, of the discretized governing equations in the form of these algebraic equations. So there are discretization errors, but no iterative convergence errors. And if you remember back, we discussed the different forms of these errors. So this is basically saying, well, there is an inherent error in step two of the numerical solution procedure. By discretizing our problem in this way, there is an associated discretization error. We know what it is. It's ordered delta x. It's ordered, in our case, delta x squared. So we know what it is, but it is there. But there are no iterative convergence errors because there is no iteration. This is generally efficient for linear systems that have some sort of structure. So tridiagonal systems is one case that we saw in the 1D example where we could use Thomas algorithm. In the 2D case, we can end up with what's called a block tridiagonal matrix so that means that the overall matrix is not tridiagonal but if you look at a uh, small sub matrices or blocks within the bigger matrix it's tridiagonal from a block point of point of view for very large matrices that are dense which is the opposite of being sparse these typically take order n cubed operations remember we talked about order of operations uh, some time ago and n cube is, is not very good. So that n is the number of unknowns. So now how many unknowns do I have? Well, I have capital I plus one times capital J plus one unknowns. That's a lot of unknowns. And that is n. Then you cube that, and that's roughly the order of the number of operations that are required to do one of these direct methods. So as the problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger, these methods do not scale well, so they do not do a good job. So for modest size problems that are linear, direct methods work very well, but for much larger problems and nonlinear problems for which we cannot adapt the direct method, we have to go to the more general iterative relaxation method. So we again, we've seen these before. This is like Jacobi, Gauss, Seidel, SOR. So you have a process, you begin with the initial guess, usually just zeros. And then you have an, a step-by-step -step iterative process that as you iterate over and over and over again, hundreds of times, thousands of times, you hope that it is converging iteratively towards the correct solution. So again, this is things like Gauss-Seidel, SOR, Jacobi. 
And I say hopefully because there's no guarantee that it has to iteratively converge towards the solution, but we can check to be sure that it, that it will, but it's, it won't necessarily in all cases. It's something you have to confirm, you have to check. It does now introduce iterative convergence errors. So you also have the discretization errors because you're doing the same discretization order delta x squared, but you now also have an iterative process. So you get iterative convergence errors. That comes from the fact that as you iterate, you're including more and more round off errors in your calculation and you stop the iteration at some point. You say, okay, that's good enough. And the convergence criteria trips, it stops. And then you say, okay, fine, that's close enough to the solution, but it's not the solution. And so there are iterative convergence errors associated with that. So that's the trade-off. So this is more general. It can be applied both to linear and nonlinear problems. It's uh, very efficient for large and sparse systems of equations, which is typically what we end up with in engineering applications. So it's great. It's generally fast. It scales well to very large systems. The trade-off is we do now have to be concerned a little bit with these iterative convergence errors. So I'm not going to say a whole lot about direct methods because they're not actually used very frequently in large-scale computing of these PDEs. They're almost always solved using iterative methods. So that's what we're going to focus our attention on. We've already seen three of these, Jacobi, Gauss, Seidel, and SOR. I'm just going to focus on Gauss, Seidel for now. Uh, but all three of these apply to PDEs just like they do to ODEs and or what we discussed way back in chapter three was solving systems of equations using these iterative techniques. All right, so let's come back to our Poisson equation with all that discussion. This is equation 920. I've just repeated it. All I've done is where I had a delta X over delta Y squared. I'm just going to call that a delta bar. All right. Just to abbreviate things a little bit, but this is exactly like the finite difference equation that we had for the Poisson equation, exactly the same. And now we're going to apply an iterative method, namely gauss seidel to come up with an algorithm that will solve for you at every point in the grid. We call this iterate, iteration or relaxation, uh, it, you know, there's actually, so Gauss as in Gaussian elimination, uh, this goes back to the 1700s and he actually wrote to a, one of his students, he wrote a letter and he says, I came up with another way to solve these systems of equations. And he, he said, it's relaxing in the sense that he was able to think about other things while he was doing this method. And this method is what we now call the gauss seidel iterative method. So he thought it was relaxing. It's actually quite tedious. No one would ever want to do this by hand now, but when you don't have a digital computer, that's the only option you had. So Gauss elimination, gauss seidel method, same Gauss. He actually preferred his iterative method because it was, well, relaxing. So we actually use that term. So iteration or relaxation, we use synonymously. And so we're going to iterate that. We're just going to keep iterating over and over again using the process I'll show you until we get a convergence, which is exactly the same process as we did back in chapter three. And we'll walk through that. So if you remember the Jacobi method, so we started the Jacobi method to kind of motivate the approach. And then we recognized that there were some issues with it that we can improve on using gauss seidel So let's kind of walk through this, a similar framework to see how this goes. So this is exactly like what we did in chapter three. It's just we have more complicated looking equations. So in the Jacobi method, what we're going to do is here's our starting point. Here's our difference equation, 921. And we're going to take our generic uij point, and we're just going to solve for it. So we're going to act like we know all of these other four terms. We're just going to put them on the right-hand side. Of course, we don't know them. So the best we can do is say, well, let's use the values from the previous iteration. And then we can calculate that right-hand side in order to get updated values for uij throughout the grid. So that's exactly what we do. And again, it just looks more complicated now. So here are those four north, south, east, and west points. 
the superscript n in parentheses indicates the iteration number. So n means the previous iterate, and n plus 1 means the current iterate. Or you could think of i as being, or n as being the current, and n plus 1 being the next one. But I'll think, I'll talk in terms of this being the previous and this being the current. So uij at the current iteration is equal to this expression that comes from values of u at the previous iteration. And all as we did to get 922 was to solve 921 for uij. That's all we did. All right, so you, you can see you can see that. Okay, great. So now we have an algorithm. I'm going to start with an initial condition on the u's, usually something like just all zeros. And then the first iteration, I put the current values of u in on the right hand side. That's the n is equal to zero iteration. Do the calculation of the right hand side of 922. And that gives me an approximation, an updated approximation for uij at n is equal to one. And then we put those values on the right, do the calculation on the right hand side to get updated values of uij at n is equal to two. And we just keep doing that over and over and over again, or more likely we have a computer do that for us. Now, what we said back in chapter three still holds here. And that is, first of all, this requires us to store all of the values at the previous iteration and at the current iteration. So I need to store all of the UIJ values at two iterations. So now this is even worse in the 2D context because I now need to have two two-dimensional arrays with every single value in it. One for previous, one for current. The other thing that happens that we discussed at the time was this process exactly as I have it here and as I described it, isn't very fast. So it's it's a rather slow, not only is it tedious, but it's also a rather slow iterative process, it requires lots of iterations to converge towards the correct solution. So the gauss seidel method fixes both of those problems by simply recognizing that some of the points have already been updated. So let's say we're sweeping through the grid so where do I have some space? Uh, let me stick it here. So we're sweeping through the grid. Here's our five point stencil. Here's IJ. And as we sweep the grid from left to right and bottom to top, these two points will have already been updated when I get to this point. Does that make sense? So I've already updated this point because I'm sweeping from left to right. I've already updated this point because I'm sweeping from left to right and bottom to top. So the n, the i j minus one point has already been updated and the i minus one j point have already been updated when I'm trying to update the i j point. So let's take the same equation 922 and simply recognize that this value and this value, I already have updated estimates for from the current iteration. So gauss seidel says, fine, use those. So 923 is exactly the same equation as 922, except that in these red terms, you'll notice that I have the n plus first, n plus first iterate. We're just simply recognizing that I already have updated values, so why not use them? So this hits the proverbial two birds with one stone, because now I don't have to store all of the previous and current UIJ values. I can just have one UIJ two-dimensional array. And just every time I update a point, I just put it into that array. And by doing so, whenever I say, use the UI minus one J, UIJ minus one values, it just uses whatever the most updated values are. If they're the old values, fine. If they're new values, great. In fact, when we program it, we don't actually have to distinguish between whether they came from the n or n plus first iterate. We just use the most recently updated values. So it solves both problems. 
solves the storage problem, cuts the storage in half, and it also speeds it up. Now, this doesn't prove that that is the case, but it is the case. If you do these problems, you try Jacobi, you try Gauss-Seidel for the same problem, you will find that the number of iterations required for Gauss-Seidel is significantly less than that required for Jacobi. So it's a win-win all the way around. No one uses Jacobi except to explain why you shouldn't use Jacobi and to show you why you should be doing Gauss-Seidel. All right, so 923 then is the finite difference equation for Gauss-Seidel applied to the Poisson equation where we have used second order accurate central difference approximations for the derivatives. Got all that? If you change any one of those things, then you will change 923. If we use a different approximation, then 923 will look different. If we use Jacobi or SOR instead of Gauss-Seidel, well, then this will look different. All right, so any one of those things can affect this. Okay, so that's Gauss-Seidel. So the basic procedure is as I've described uh, with my hand waving, but now let's be more explicit. So first you start with an initial guess. So that corresponds to N is equal to zero. So you specify the values of uij zero. Again, almost always we just use all zeros unless there's some reason to use something else. Then you relax or you iterate on that as we've just described using this equation 923 in order to get the first approximation. So uij n is equal to one. Then those go on the right-hand side, update to get uij two, and then three, and then four, and you just keep iterating until it converges. And the convergence test is just like we had before. And so I, I walk through a motivation for why this convergence test is a good one. It's not the only one, it's not used universally, but it is a very robust one. And again, we walk through in chapter three, why we use maxes and maxes and differences and so on. So you can look back at that. But in any case, the point is we will stop the iterative process when the current iterate values are very close to the previous iterate values. So in other words, the iteration process is no longer really changing the solution very much. So it changes a lot, the error comes down fast, and then eventually the error no longer goes down very fast. And so it just kind of goes on very, very slowly. And eventually you just say, okay, good enough. It, the difference is smaller than epsilon. Let's stop the iterative process. All right, any questions about any of that? So it's nothing, none of this is any different than we, what we did for the 1D case, except that how we do step three. So step two is exactly the same. It's just two dimensional instead of one dimensional. Then step three, we have to change a little bit because now we have a different type of system, a different form of system of algebraic equations. So that's why we need a little different approach to solving it. So in the 1D case, we can use the direct Thomas algorithm to solve the tridiagonal system of equations. In the 2D case, we can't use Thomas. We, we actually, we can using what's called alternating direction implicit method, which I'm not gonna get into uh, right now. But um, for our purposes, we're gonna say, okay, fine. It's no longer tridiagonal. Let's now use Gauss-Seidel to solve it. No questions? All right, so let's think about how we would apply boundary conditions. These are essentially just 2D extensions to what we did in the 1D case. So nothing really new here per se, except from the point of view of the fact that, okay, now we're gonna have two dimensional rather than one dimensional uh, boundary conditions and equations. So we need to be a little more careful about the two dimensionality aspect. So let's think in terms of Dirichlet boundary conditions first. So this is exactly like, exactly analogous to the 1D case where Dirichlet would mean we know the values of u at the left and right boundaries of the domain. And then we only have to calculate for the interior points in the 1D domain. Here, it's exactly the same. So when i is equal to one, that corresponds to the left boundary. When little i is big i plus one, that corresponds to the right boundary. When j is little j is one, that corresponds to the bottom boundary. And when little j is capital J plus one, 
that corresponds to the top boundary. So now again, rather than just being two points on the boundary, I now have all of my points that lie on any one of those four boundaries that now I know the values of uij and I don't need to solve for them in my algorithm. So for example, if I look at a point in the lower left-hand corner of my domain. So if this is the lower left-hand corner, so that'd be one, one, and then we'll have our first grid line in. So this will be two, one, this will be one, two, and then this will be two, two. So if I have Dirichlet boundary conditions, I know the value of u here, here, and here, because they're given on the boundary. So the first one inside that I need to calculate is for i is equal to two and j is equal to two. So when I apply my Gauss-Seidel equation for two, two, i is equal to two and j is equal to two, I get this. So it's u two, two on the left, and then I have three, two, one, two, two, three, two, one, two, two on the right. These two points, so one, two, that's known. So it just picks that off. You just put it in the array, the known value of U one, two, you put that in, and then that just gets used when you calculate U two, two. It's, you're not iterating, so I took off the superscript N. Same thing with two one. That again just comes off the boundary. So this value and this value never change. They're the Dirichlet values given by the boundary conditions, and they're just going to be used when I to calculate two two. But again, the point is you put all those in on the boundary, and so whenever you need a value, so in order to calculate two two, for example, I need this value and this value. Fine. No problem, they're in the array, just pluck them out as you need them using your gauss seidel You don't need a separate equation. You don't need to do anything special. I'm recognizing here mathematically that this is not being iterated upon, but in terms of your algorithm, it has no, makes no difference because these superscripts are really gone in your algorithm. So you're just picking off these various values whether they're changing because they're in the interior or because they're not changing because they're Dirichlet boundary conditions on the boundary, either way. All right, so that's simple. Dirichlet boundary conditions are very straightforward. Now, Neumann boundary conditions or Robin boundary conditions, we'll look at Neumann. Once again, we're gonna do these the same way, the exact same way that we did in the 1D ODE case on Tuesday like we started with the uh, extended fin problem. And um, we'll just see how this works out for two dimensions, but basically it's the same exact approach. So we have our difference equation back here, 923. So this is always our general difference equation. And now we, let's say we have a Neumann boundary condition of this form. So at X is equal to zero. So that's on the left boundary we're gonna say that partial U partial X is some known constant C. So again, that would be like, if this is a heat conduction problem, that's like saying on the left boundary, I know the heat flux, the heat flux is being specified to be some constant value on that left X is equal to zero boundary. So let's, so if you think back to Tuesday, what we did was, it was kind of a two-step process. We first applied the general finite difference equation at the boundary then we had, when we did that, a point that was outside the domain. So then we applied the boundary condition at the boundary, finite difference it, and use that to eliminate the ghost point, to eliminate the point outside the domain. So now we're gonna do exactly the same thing, exactly the same two steps, but again, now in a two-dimensional context. So 923, our general finite difference equation, I'm gonna apply it when I is equal to one. So apply it at the left boundary. So I is one, I is one, I is one, 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 one. Now, obviously for I plus one, that's now two, and I minus one, well, that's now zero. So I've highlighted in red the point that's outside the domain. That's the one that we need to eliminate. 
the way we eliminate it, eliminate it is to apply the boundary condition right here. First derivative of u with respect to x is equal to c. Apply that at the boundary as well. So using a second order accurate central difference approximation to the first derivative, it says that ui plus 1j minus ui minus 1j over 2 delta x is equal to c, but i is equal to 1. So i plus 1 is 2, and i minus 1 is 0. So once again, I've highlighted in red the point that's outside the domain. I solve for that from this equation. So I get that u0j is equal to u2j minus 2c delta x. And now I can substitute this back into here to get my Gauss-Seidel equation. So that's the same, again, same process in 1D. We're now just applying to 2D. So we do the same thing all the way up and down that left boundary for all J along that left boundary. All right, so let's do it. So let's substitute this expression back into 925. And I get this. So this now is the finite difference equation that I'm going to apply when I is equal to 1. So for all the interior i's, 2 through capital I, I will use 923. But for the points when I is equal to 1, the points along the left boundary, I'm going to use 927. Looks similar, but as you can see, I have eliminated the point outside the domain. OK, that's it. Not for class. Don't go. Whew, that was close. Almost lost you. That's it. OK, so then you have the same procedure for Dirichlet to do the interior points, sweeping through the I's and the J's in the interior. Now you just have an additional sweep over all the points along the left boundary for J when I is equal to 1 using this new equation. Now, what happens if, let's go a step further. What happens if at the top, you also have a Neumann boundary condition? Let's say along the top boundary, so when y is equal to b, that partial u partial y is equal to, to d. So again, you have the normal derivative, now partial u partial y is known. So again, that's like a heat flux boundary condition, but at the top. So that we would do the same thing for along the top, but then you think, well, what about the corner? What about this corner right here? So this point would be one capital J plus one. So this, this is the left boundary, X is equal to zero. And this is the top boundary, Y is equal to B. So let me write that. So this is X is equal to zero. And this is y is equal to b. So this is the upper left-hand corner of the domain. So on the left, I have partial u, partial x is c. And we would apply that to get the boundary conditions at all the points on that left boundary, except for at the top. Because let's look at what would happen if I apply this expression which applies along the left boundary. If I apply that at little j is equal to capital J plus one, well, then I have a capital J, little j plus one, which is a capital J plus two. Where is that? That's this point up here. That would be one capital J plus two. Just like this point here would be zero capital J plus one. Oh, this is confusing. It's really not. It's just more of the same. So what we're looking at is how are we going to treat this point right at the corner? We already took care of these. That's using equation 927. We would do a similar thing for these points at the top. And now the question is, well, what's going on at this corner point? Well, I know what's going on on the left, every point on the left boundary. That's the equation 927. So let's use that as the starting point. I'm going to apply it at this point. As I just showed you, that will involve this point that's outside the domain. 
which we will then eliminate using this boundary condition. So exactly the same as before, we're just doing it twice over, once to eliminate this point and once to eliminate this point as well. Okay, so here we go. So apply 927 at the upper left-hand corner. So little i is one and little j is capital J plus one. I wrote it down exactly with, with now little j is capital J plus one. That includes this point that I've highlighted in red, which corresponds to capital J plus two, which is the point outside the domain, sticking out above the upper boundary. So once again, apply the corresponding boundary condition. So this is partial u partial y is equal to d. Here's a second order accurate central difference approximation for that first derivative, which is uij plus one minus uij minus one, little j's now, over two delta y is equal to d, but little j is capital J plus one. So we have a capital J plus two and a capital J. Once again, I've highlighted in red the offending point. I solve for that here. I substitute that back into 929 right there, and I get this equation. Now this equation only applies at that corner. So it only applies when little i is one and little j is capital J plus one in that upper left-hand corner. So if you stop and think about, okay, what if I had a rectangular domain, which obviously has four sides to it, and I had Neumann boundary conditions on every side, how many equations do I have to derive? Well, I have to derive the middle equation, right, for the interior, so that's one. Then I have to do the x equals zero boundary, so that's two. Oh, then I have to do the top boundary, three, right boundary, bottom boundary, ah, and then I gotta do the individual corners. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I actually have nine equations I have to derive. I've derived only two of them, uh, three of them, sorry, because I did the interior, I did the left boundary, and I did the upper left-hand corner. But that's only three of the nine. So this gets a bit painful, a bit tedious in terms of doing the paper calculations, the paperwork to set up uh, your code. All right, but it's just a lot of the same thing and you'll see the same patterns over and over again. All right, basic process, okay. So let's look at an example. So let's do the temperature distribution U. So U is temperature for heat conduction in a square domain. So it's a domain that goes from zero to one, zero to one in both X and Y. So if it's heat conduction, then the right-hand side is zero. So we just have the Laplace equation. So all the equations hold that we had, but F is equal to zero in the Poisson equation to give us Laplace. Let's say the boundary conditions are such that U is equal to zero on the left, right, and bottom boundaries, and U is equal to one on the top. So that would be like having zero temperature on these three sides left, right, and bottom. And then on the top, you have the temperature one. You solve the equation, you do the Gauss-Seidel, and I'm just gonna show you the solution. Here it is. So these are isotherms. These are lines of constant temperature, lines of constant U. They are zero on these three boundaries, one on the top boundary, and then each of these contours, each of these isotherms are, are temperatures of point, increments of 0.1. So this is 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 0.9, and then one. And so you can see it, it makes intuitive sense. The heat is diffusing in from that heated top boundary, and then it gets diffused into the domain. So that, that makes sense physically, intuitively. That's something like what you would guess the temperature distribution would look like in such a scenario. And indeed, if you do the numerical, numerical calculation, that's what you get. So the only thing I've hidden from you is I actually haven't shown the iterative solutions as you go, but I did the iterative process using Gauss-Seidel. 
exactly as I just described it. These are all Dirichlet boundary conditions, so it's an easier case. I don't have all these equations on the boundaries. I just have the equation in the interior. So that's nice and straightforward. And then I just iterate, iterate, iterate until it converges to a solution. And that's what it looks like. Cool. I know you all want to do this yourself. So as promised, noting Connie's objection, as promised, your last problem set, problem set number seven, is to is all about applying these finite difference methods to boundary value problems. So that will be due a week from tomorrow. So whatever date that is, next Friday, midnight. So it's on the website, the problem set is, but I haven't put the turn in folder there with the due date, so I'll put that up as well. Uh, so those will be due a week from tomorrow, midnight. Oh, you have a COVID study day tomorrow. Congratulations. <laughs> really? Really only labs in our department. It's really only labs. So other departments, some have Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes of 50 minutes. We actually used to do that. So our Tuesday, Thursday classes were 75. And then we had Monday, Wednesday classes that were 50 minutes, which works out the same. And then we switched them all to Monday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Thursday, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, so for us in our department, it's, it's basically labs on Fridays, and that's it. So sorry, no labs. As I keep reminding you, the whole point of COVID study day is not to get COVID, but to study. Not study COVID, but something useful. Okay. All right, so problem set seven will be due a week from tomorrow midnight. Okay, no questions? Boy, you guys are so, of course, no one speaks up online except to uh, poke fun at me or try to get me off on tangents about soccer. Speaking of which, Manchester United is playing right now. Does anybody know, has they won Europa League semifinal? We've lost four semifinals in a row. We need to win a semifinal. All right, that's okay. This stuff is more important. I will sacrifice my team for the betterment of our students. Okay, I'm gonna start for the last uh, 15 minutes, well, 20 minutes actually of class or so, 15 to 20 minutes. We're gonna start talking about initial value problems. So we're basically gonna parallel exactly what we just did in the last chapter for boundary value problems. We'll focus first on ODEs, so one-dimensional cases in, in time, and then we'll look at higher dimensional cases, which get us into PDEs. So we'll kind of go through the same basic structure, and you'll, so you'll see here ordinary differential equations, ordinary differential equations, then partial differential equations. The terminology is gonna change significantly the methods are gonna be quite different because they, the mathematics has a very different character. So let me introduce this. We've already seen uh, some examples of IVPs. The most recent one was the force spring mass system with drag that we looked at. Uh, this is probably wrong. I don't think I updated that section number. I don't think that's correct. It's probably eight. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I have to look, but anyway. So, so we derived this this, remember, was back when I first introduced the numerical solution procedure, and I used this simple system, dynamical system, as an illustration of doing the step one, two, and three in the numerical solution procedure. And so the result of step one was this governing equation for the forced spring mass system with drag. The point being, this is now an initial value problem. You have initial conditions at t is equal to zero, in this case on the position u and on the velocity u dot. So you tell me what the position is and the velocity is at t is equal to zero. And then using this equation, we can march forward in time to see how the spring mass system, how the mass moves. What is the position of the mass according to equation 10.1? So you're gonna hear me say this a lot. I'm gonna talk a lot about solutions marching forward in time. So boundary value problems, we're iterating. We're 
we're iterating towards a converged solution, at least we hope so. Now you're going to hear me talking about marching from one time step to another, starting at t is equal to zero and moving forward in time. That's kind of the terminology we'll be using, starting with initial conditions as we go. So the way this will look for ODEs is as follows. So we have our time. That's the only independent variable. We start at t is equal to zero, the initial conditions. That will correspond to n is equal to zero. And then we're going to march one, two, three, forward in time. So for ODEs, that'll be the basic process. So in a sense, our finite difference stencil is going to then uh, be on this time domain rather than on the spatial domain. We'll, we'll get to spatial when we get to PDEs, but for now, just on time. There are classifications of methods based on how many steps we'll use, how many time steps we'll use, and also based on whether it's an explicit or implicit method. So we could have single step explicit methods, single step implicit methods, multi-step explicit, multi-step implicit methods. So two different types of classifications that are not mutually exclusive. So you can have any combinations of these. And they're just what they sound like. So a single step method simply means that when I try to get the solution at the current time step, I'm only going to use solutions from the one previous time step. So it's a single step method. I have the solution of the previous time step, n, and I want to get the solution at the current time step, n plus one. That's it, one step, single step. A multi-step method says, all right, I have the solution at all previous times. I want to get the solution at the current time. And so I'm going to use multiple previous steps, maybe two, maybe three, whatever. So then it becomes a multi-step method. We'll focus primarily on single step methods. I'll say a little bit about multi-step methods. The other distinction is between explicit and implicit methods. And again, this uh, connotates a certain type of finite difference equation. So an explicit method is such that the solution at the current time step can be written in terms of an explicit expression, thus the name, in terms of solutions at pr the previous time step, or if it's multi-step, previous time steps. But we'll talk in terms of one previous time step. So that'll become more clear in a moment when I show you what they look like. So this is going to be, so you can think of like gauss seidel is really like an explicit method. We don't use that term in the boundary value problem context because it doesn't have this time marching aspect to it, but it's ex an explicit equation in the sense that you only have one unknown and everything else is taken as known. So that's an explicit expression. There's only one unknown and everything, and that's the solution of the current time step. Everything else in the equation is known from previous time steps. An implicit method is where the solution at the current time step has to be solved for implicitly because we have an algebraic equation for the unknown solutions at the current time step. So again, that'll become clear when I show you what they look like. But now, rather than having one unknown and therefore an explicit algebraic expression, we're gonna have multiple unknowns. And so we're gonna have to solve for them all at the same time using some sort of technique. And so we have to solve for them implicitly. So basically the difference is here one time step or multiple time steps. Here is one unknown, here is multiple unknowns. Basically that's the distinction between those possibilities. Okay, the other thing that we have to worry about is when we talked about boundary value problems, we only had to worry about the accuracy. So the accuracy was how wrong is our numerical solution? The only source of, the, of error was the truncation error, the discretization error that occurred because we truncated our Taylor series. So all we had to know was whether it was first order accurate or second order accurate or, or whatever. 
So is it order delta x? Is it order delta x squared? And that told us the accuracy of the algorithm being used to solve the boundary value problem. In initial value problems, we still have to worry about the accuracy for the same reason. We're still going to be using finite difference approximations. So we'll still be talking about the order of accuracy, whether it's or first order accurate in time, second order accurate in time. It's just time now instead of x, but that doesn't make any difference. But in addition to the accuracy in the form of the truncation error, we also have an additional thing that we have to worry about, and that is numerical stability. This is not an issue because it cannot arise in boundary value problems, but it is an issue because it can arise in initial value problems. The question is as follows. As the numerical solution is progressing, as I march from one time step to the next, every time step I'm introducing little errors. So little round off errors and they're adding up. And the question is, what does my algorithm do with those errors? Does it amplify those errors? Do those errors grow? So as I go in time, the errors can get bigger and bigger and bigger and they eventually pollute the solution. Or do the errors stay small? Do they get, get smaller as the numerical solution marches forward in time? Or do they at least stay basically the same? And that again is a, the question of numerical stability. If it's numerically stable, then great. The round off errors are there but they never get grown or amplified by the numerical algorithm. If it's unstable, then the numerical algorithm itself takes those little disturbances, those little errors and makes them get bigger and bigger, makes them grow. So uh, we'll talk about uh, both accuracy and numerical stability now as we go through this. Here's the basic construct or the basic step-by-step uh, -step process I'm gonna take. First, we'll solve a single first order initial value problem. That's the easiest possible case. We'll stick with linear problems, uh, even nonlinear. Many of these you could solve exactly. So this is just gonna kind of set the foundation for the harder cases. In this case, u as a function of t is a scalar function. That'll be the position, that'll be the temperature or whatever as a function of time. Then we'll look at systems of first order OD, uh, IVPs. So a single first order IVP, then a system of first order IVPs. And in that case, then our solution U is a vector function because there's gonna be a U1 of T, a U2 of T, U3 of T. And so we'll have a system of IVPs. And then we'll talk about higher order IVPs. So second and higher order and we'll show how we can convert those to systems of IVPs that allow us to use the methods developed into. So that's gonna be kind of be the progression. Single first order to systems of first order to higher order that we can convert to systems of first order. So for the ordinary differential equation section, then we'll move on to PDs, but for the ordinary differential equation section, that's gonna be kind of the roadmap that we're gonna take. All right, so single step methods. So let's start with first order explicit method. So the, this also goes by the name, the Euler method as in Leonard Euler. He developed this many, 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 many years ago. But I call it, most people call it, a lot of people call it the first order explicit method because it says what it is. It's only first order accurate in time. And it's an explicit method in the, in the context of what I just described. So we have a first order initial value problem. First order means the highest order derivative is one, so du dt, and that's equal to some function of the independent variable t and the dependent variable u. Great. Then we have an initial condition. We only need one initial condition because it's only first order in time, first order derivative in time. So the position or the temperature or whatever u represents at t is equal to zero is going to be some known value u0. So that's our initial condition. So this, this right-hand side function, that could be linear. Uh, the examples I'm gonna to do today are all gonna be linear to illustrate this, or they could be nonlinear as well. So in terms of applying, particularly the first order explicit method, it actually doesn't matter. It's no more difficult for nonlinear than it is for linear. So we're gonna discretize the domain as I said a moment ago, as I described a moment ago. So time will go forward like this. T is equal to zero. 
n is equal to zero. You'll notice I'm going to use the superscript n in parentheses again, but now that re represents a time step rather than an iteration number. So I'm going to use the same notation, but now in this context, it represents the time step as opposed to the iteration number. So we start at the initial condition, t is equal to zero, n is equal to zero, and then we march, n is equal to one, two, and then a generic tn and a generic tn plus one. And then those are distance delta t apart. So delta t is the time step that is the difference between the previous time, tn, and the next time, tn plus one. So in terms of index, this will be n and n plus one. So as we usually do, we'll use these as our indices to indicate the time step. And when I say the nth time step, what I really mean is tn. That's the time at the nth time step. At the n plus first time step, we mean tn plus one. And again, those are a delta t apart. Okay, so for the first order explicit method, we're going to use a first order accurate forward difference, and I'll talk about why that is in a second, to approximate our initial value problem. So let's just do it first, and then we'll talk about it. So this is a first order accurate forward difference approximation for the first derivative, partial u, partial t. So that's u at n plus one minus un over delta t. That is only first order accurate, thus the name, first order, explicit method. And then on the right-hand side, we have the function of t and u being evaluated at the nth time step, so which is the previous time step for which we know both t, of course, and u. So everything on the right is known. The only unknown is un plus one. So I solve for the only unknown, that's un plus one. So that's equal to un plus delta t times the f evaluated for tn and un. Now you'll notice when I multiply through by delta t, that makes this an order delta t squared. So you can see that here. It's still only a first order accurate approximation of the first derivative, because I used a forward difference, but in expressed in this form, now the discretization or truncation error looks as if it's order delta t squared. All right, I'll, I'll come back to why we use first order forward differences in a second. First of all, this is indeed an explicit expression because I have only one unknown. That's the value of u at the current time level, n plus one, in terms of the value of u at the previous time level, un. So it is an explicit expression and it's first order accurate because that's the accuracy of the, of the finite difference approximation I used for the derivative. Okay, now let's, let's think about why did I use a forward difference? Well, go back to this. So I have the solution here at Tn. I'm looking for the solution at Tn plus one. So what if I approximated the solution here? Uh, sorry, approximate the equation here. So approximate equation 10.3 here. X marks the spot. Okay, so x marks the spot. I apply the equation here. In order to pick up this future value at n plus one, I have to use a forward difference approximation to do that. So that's what we do. Now you say, well, why not use a central difference at the same point? Use the previous value and the next time step. There's actually a problem with that. You can do that. Uh, that's called the dufort frankel method. Uh, but there are some issues with that, which I won't get into. So uh, we'll, we'll do it this way. So we're going to do a forward difference from the point here where we know the solution forward to the point where we're looking for the solution. But in doing so, it's only a first order accurate approximation. All right, I'm going to stop there. I don't want to get into the example yet because I want to rush through it. But we'll do some examples of this to show, and I'll, I'll show you the numerical solutions. 
as they progress with time so we can see how this is how this works all right any questions before we adjourn move to adjourn second anyone opposed no we are adjourned excellent